my pleasure to welcome you to the Robert H. Jackson Center here in Jamestown, New York. My name is Deke Kathman. I'm the executive director here. Uh, as you may know, the Jackson Center is an educational institution. For this event, we have joined with the, a religious organization, the Jehovah Witnesses, to commemorate the historically significant decision of the Supreme Court in 1943 known as the Barnett decision. We will remain forever proud that our own Robert H. Jackson authored the court's majority opinion supporting this decision. Aside from the all-star list of dignitaries noted in your program, I would like to acknowledge the members of the Office of Public Information at the Watchtower headquarters. Uh, it has been just a tremendous effort on their part to make this thing go. Tremendous. I would also point out the presence of the program officer of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's program on ethics, religion, and the Holocaust. Rebecca Carter Chand is here today. And finally, present to, along with her family, is Lynn Covington Elfers, daughter of Hayden Covington. Thank you all for traveling to Jamestown, New York, and welcome to the Jackson Center. And a special welcome to our audience members from Jamestown High School. Go Raiders. Uh, I have a bias in that regard. So anyway. <clears throat> I now pass the baton to the man that makes this place go, co-founder of the Robert H. Jackson Center, Mr. Greg Peterson. We also need to recognize the Randolph Cardinals, right? Yeah. All right. I also want to recognize uh, Professor Robert Sai, who really gave us a terrific keynote address last night. So thank you for setting the stage for today's uh, commemoration of the 75th anniversary of West Virginia versus Barnett. Big picture for the students especially is the fact that in 1940 there was a decision and called Gabitis versus Minersville, which said that the comp legislation compulsory flag salute was constitutional, which directly affected the teachings of the Jehovah's Witness, and they were expelled from schools. And they were, pros and they were absolutely persecuted in many, many forms and manners. Within a short period of time in 1943, the United States Supreme Court again took up a virtually identical fact pattern called West Virginia versus Barnett. And Robert Jackson wrote an opinion, which in fact uh, was the majority opinion, and that ruled that, that such legislation in West Virginia was unconstitutional, thus ending a very difficult time in Court's history. In fact, he read, he wrote, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. We're going to have a chance to see a play here of national history day finalists, which talk to the incredible story of what occurred in Nazi Germany in the 30s and found its way here in the United States. But I do want to call out the fact that in the audience today is, in fact, people representing that timeline. We have Judith Gabitis Close, the daughter of Lillian Gabitis. Remember, I said 1940. Gabitis case, she's here. And we had a chance to interview her mother a few years ago, and so glad that Judith, you could come here from Atlanta to be part of this. We have also Louise Blanton. Because of that case of Gabitis, the uh, members of the Jehovah's Witness were persecuted and thrown out of school, so they had to create kingdom schools. And so Louise Blanton is here, who actually lived from 1940 when the Gabitis case uh, came down through 1943 when the Barnett case reversed it. 
going to a kingdom school in New Jersey. A phenomenal story, and we'll hear more about that today. And we also have Marie Barnett, of Barnett fame, and she's here today coming up from Florida. I'm just so thrilled that we have folks that represent that time period. And as Dee Catherine mentioned earlier, we also have the benefit of Lynn Covington Elders, who was the daughter of the attorney who handled those cases, and also Thomas Loftus, who is the grandson of Robert Jackson, who delivered the majority opinion. All one place, one time, right here, to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Barnett case. And in order to set this framework, I'm thrilled to introduce uh, National History Day finalists, folks from the state of Washington, brothers and sisters, Sister uh, Giovanni and Michaela Bartasono. And so sit back and relax and enjoy the faithful do not yield. My name is Giovanni Bartasono. And I'm Michaela Bartasono. And this is the faithful, faithful do, do not, not yield. When someone mentions the Holocaust, one would most likely think of the Jews in Germany and how they were hated because of their race. While this is true, they were not the only people persecuted during World War II. Another group of people, known as Jehovah's Witnesses, took a stand against Nazi assault and were put in concentration camps in Germany. Persecution of the Witnesses also occurred in the United States. During World War II, the persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses led them to take a stand for their faith in many different situations, in both the United States and in Germany, by continuing to remain faithful under harsh persecution and refusing to do anything contrary to their beliefs. Ha Hitler! Good morning, students. Good morning. Muller, come here. Why don't you greet me with Hal Hitler? Hal Hitler means that Hitler is my salvation. I believe that Jehovah God is my salvation. <coughs> it would be against my conscience to say such a thing, sir. What? You pig! Get away from me, you stink! Farther away! Shame! A traitor! In 1933, school authorities began to require students to salute to Hitler many times throughout the school day. Students were surrounded by signs of swastikas, expected to participate in political activities, and were required to accept Hitler as their fear through pledges, poetry, and other forms of adulation. Students who were Jehovah's Witnesses were constantly forced to choose between their religious beliefs and school expectations. Most witness students were shamed, beaten, and harassed by their teachers and peers in school. The U.S. and German government saw the witnesses as threats because of their political neutrality and uncompromising faith. For this reason, witness students in the United States face similar injustice. Good morning, students. Before we begin class today, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Billy, go fight us. We've been through this before. Why won't you pledge your allegiance and salute the flag? Put up your arm. I will not pledge my allegiance nor salute the flag because it violates my religious convictions, ma'am. I'm only trying to meet my God's standards. You and your sister Lillian are going to be expelled, and you will have no one to blame but yourselves. In 1935, Joseph Rutherford, the president of the Watchtower, Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania, stated that when one salutes the flag, he or she looks to it for their salvation when only God has the power to save. He said that the flag salute and the Hitler salute are both religious acts. So, some witnesses in the United States stopped pledging their allegiance to the American flag. Billy and Lillian Gobitis were just two of the many Jehovah's Witnesses who were influenced by this speech to make the brave stand to not say the Pledge of Allegiance. Within a year later, the secret state police of Nazi Germany, or the Gestapo, conducted a mass arrest of Jehovah's Witnesses. But throughout the harsh persecution, the Jehovah's Witnesses stood firm in their beliefs. We were forced into concentration camps 
But he shaved our hair off. Yes, it is the right length. And we were given these blue and white striped uniforms to wear. We are barely fed and frequently worked. After we work long hours, we grow tired, and the guards would beat us. With every blow, they would shout, Do you still believe in Jehovah? By 1937, there was about 6,000 of us in the concentration camps. As Jehovah's Witnesses, we were made to wear an upside-down purple triangle as a way for them to identify us. It was just last week the Nazis had carried out their first public execution in the Sachsenhausen concentration camps in attempts for them to break us. We watched August Dickman get shot by seven SS men, and after the Commandant ordered us, Step forward if you have changed your mind about military service. But none of us recanted. Overall, the Commandant was never able to shatter our faith. On November 6, 1935, Charles E. Rudebush, the Minersville, Pennsylvania school superintendent, called for me to discuss why Lillian and Billy Gobitis would not salute the flag and expel both children. Billy and Lillian's father sued the Minersville School District for violating their First Amendment rights of the U.S. Constitution. The case advanced to the Federal District Court of Philadelphia and then to the Appellate Court in which both courts sided with the Gobitis family. As patriotism increased, violence against the witnesses intensified. Mobs filled the streets where they burned down the witnesses' places of worship, where they weren't even given a warning from the police. Hatred towards witnesses amplified as the Gobitis case reached the Supreme Court. <coughs> At this time, you may make your closing statements. The Gobitis children should have not been expelled and should be immediately readmitted into their school. Their freedom of religion has been violated by the Minersville School District. Justice needs to be served. The Supreme Court has come to a decision with an 8 to 1 ruling against the Gobitis family. We have made the decision to reverse the two lower court rulings, and that is final. National unity is the basis of national security. <laughs> After the decision of the Gobitis case on June 3, 1940, there were two more crucial cases for the Jehovah's Witnesses who were fighting for religious freedom. In the Jones versus City of Opelika case, the Witnesses lost with a 5-4 ruling. Three of the Justices who had ruled in favor of the Witnesses had previously ruled against the Gobitis family. These three Justices came to a realization that the Gobitis case was wrongly decided. In 1943, the Opelika decision was annulled. A New York Times editorial stated, We think the rights of all Americans are a little safer because Jehovah's Witnesses have had their second day in court. The West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett case, much like the Gobitis case, later went to the Supreme Court. In 1943, a 6 to 3 decision was made in favor of the Barnetts and the Gobitis decision was reversed. The court decided that no officials had the right to force people to violate their personal beliefs. These court cases were not the only victories won by Jehovah's Witnesses. German forces attempted to break the Witnesses by demanding them to sign a document renouncing the religion for their freedom. This was actually a triumph for the Witnesses because refusing to submit to the Nazi regime only made their stand stronger. If you sign this, you will be freed. But if you don't, you'll be freed through the crematorium chimney and turned into a bar of soap. What is this? First, you will have to come to know that the International Bible Student Association is proclaiming erroneous teachings and under the cloak of religion follows hostile purposes against the state. Secondly, you, you want me to sacrifice my religion for freedom? If I sign this, I would be forced to betray all of my fellow witnesses and renounce the beliefs that I know to be true. Not only would I have to regard the Bible as false, but I would be forced to give up spreading its truth. 
I would be forced to join the war effort and to believe that the German government is the highest power. I cannot do this. I will not sign this declaration to satisfy Hitler's wrath. I will stand against this. I rather prove myself worthy to Jehovah God than bow down to a wicked human being. In Germany, over 20,000 Jehovah's Witnesses stayed active and never renounced the religion for their freedom. They stood strong against Nazi assault, and their faith helped them to do so. In the US, military service was expected of men, and those who did not comply were thrown into prisons. Jehovah's Witnesses remained loyal to their beliefs and showed how indestructible their faith was, even in prisons. Let's go! You witnesses deserve to be thrown into prison for your unwillingness to fight for your country. What have we done wrong? Do I deserve to be imprisoned? Must I be punished for remaining loyal to my God? Throughout World War II, Jehovah's Witnesses held an unwavering position against persecution and Hitler's attempt to shatter their faith. They remained loyal to their faith and refused to abandon their beliefs, thus proving their unbendable stand against persecution in Nazi Germany. Their stand strengthened freedom of religion and moral beliefs in the United States. Americans' rights of religious freedom was strengthened from the stand that was taken by Jehovah's Witnesses all the way to the Supreme Court. As Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson famously declared, If there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or for citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. The, the faithful, faithful do, do not, not yield. yield. I trust mom and dad knew about this. <laughs> Terrific job. Thank you so much. You can see why they were National History Day finalist. Thank you. At this point uh, in the program, I want to introduce Jolene Chu, senior researcher, the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witness, who will, present it, will be presenting a program called the Illustrated Presentation of the Historical Backdrop of the Nazi Era. Jolene? Michaela Giovanni, powerful, powerful job. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you know, in the course of developing the play, you did a tremendous amount of research, so yes. we thought it'd be very good to tap your brains to answer three basic why questions to help us understand the historical context of what happened. Mm -hmm. The first would be, why would the Nazis, who had millions of so-called victims, uh, so-called enemies, why would they bother to target a few thousand Jehovah's Witnesses? Uh, the second question, is why would such a tiny group dare to take a stand against a totalitarian regime? And the third question is why and how the events in Nazi Germany affected events in the United States? Mm -hmm. So we have to say that in answer to uh, the first two questions, uh, really it's an ideological issue. And so we'd like you to help us to understand the basic belief systems of the Nazis and the witnesses. So first of all, uh, Giovanni, maybe you could help us define this basic uh, principle of Nazism was extreme nationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, their national anthem said, uh, Germany, Germany above all, above all else in the world. Uh, so Germany was the best and the Nazis had fought so that Germany could rule the entire world. That's right, it was a struggle for world domination. Mm -hmm. 
Nazism was famous for its racism, but it was actually a genocidal racism. Yes, um, the Nazis had said that blonde-haired, blue-eyed Aryans were the master race, and that other races such as Jews, Slavic people, Roma or Gypsies, Africans and others um, were inferior and should be enslaved or killed. Tragically, they succeeded in large measure. The third principle was the Fuhrer principle. Fuhrer in Germany, German means leader, mm -hmm. and the idea was that the supreme leader exercised total control and was entitled to total obedience and unquestioning loyalty of the people. Now let's take a look at Jehovah's Witness beliefs. First we have a kind of hybrid word, supranationalism. Mm -hmm. So supra means beyond or outside, and the witnesses believe that there were no nations when God created the earth and that borders are a man-made thing, so we shouldn't treat people differently just because they come from a different country. And humanity as family? Uh, the witnesses believe that since all humans came from Adam and Eve, uh, we're all related, uh, so no one has the right to say that he or she um, is better than one another because of skin color or ethnic origin. And finally, the idea of the kingdom of God. Now, this is a common concept among many religions, mm -hmm. but for the witnesses, the kingdom actually is a government that one day will rule over the whole earth, and so they believe they should only pledge loyalty and obedience to that kingdom or government. So as we look at these points, and counterpoints, mm -hmm. we can begin to understand why the two belief systems clashed. Mm -hmm. Now, to get a little more specific, let's talk about the Nazi context. So let's take this word again, supra or outside national borders, and how did that translate into action for the witnesses in Germany? So supranational uh, means that the witnesses are apolitical uh, or neutral when it comes to politics or war, wherever they live. Um, so in Nazi Germany, they didn't vote for Hitler, um, and they even refused to join the army. That's right. You mentioned the execution of this young witness, mm -hmm. August Dickmann, shot in front of 400 of his fellow witnesses in Sachsenhausen concentration camp. Yeah. And the New York Times reported that he was the first objector of the war to be executed, mm -hmm. only two weeks after the war began. He was actually one of 340 witnesses who were executed. We see some of them here, some from France, uh, Germany, Poland, and the Netherlands. And one of them was a young German named Wolfgang Kusero. He was age 20 when he refused the draft. And Michael, you have an excerpt mm -hmm. of the testimony that he gave mm -hmm. before the military tribunal. He wrote, I was brought up as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. According to God's word, the greatest and most holy law he gave mankind is, you shall love your God above all else and your neighbor as yourself. You must not kill. Did our creator have all this written down for the trees? That's right. He was beheaded. Now, this uh, value is much related to this idea that humanity is all related as a family. It's a life-affirming value that motivated witnesses not only to reject killing, but also Nazi laws that were devaluing and dehumanizing of its enemies. For instance, this man, Martin Bertram, he's seen mm -hmm. in the center, he was a baker. Now, German businesses were required by Nazi law to become Germanized, which meant that they would not sell their wares to non-Germans. Bertram refused. He was reportedly uh, guilty of saying, I have enough bread for everyone, and he continued to sell bread to his Jewish clients. Well, the Nazis shut down his store and took away the business. Eventually, he was sent to a camp for eight and a half years. He did survive. And in front of his house now in Frankfurt stands a monument to commemorate his act of conscience. So there were about 10,000 witnesses who were sent to prisons and camps, where, as you noted, they received the Purple Triangle. Mm -hmm. There were a number of symbols given to prisoners, but the witnesses were the only Christian group to receive their own symbol. 
Now the third value we talked about is this idea of the kingdom being a government, and mm -hmm. this ran straight up against the idea of the Fuhrer. Uh, this is a very famous 1936 propaganda poster, and there was a conscious effort to position Hitler as a messiah, messianic-like figure or godlike mm -hmm. figure to be worshipped. Michaela, how did the Heil Hitler salute fit into cultivating this image? So every time people met, they had to acknowledge Hitler as their leader. That's right. So we'd like to listen to an interview clip. This interview was done of Simone Liebster some years ago by the Shoah Foundation, and uh, we'll hear more from her later. But at this point, we want her to explain how that affected witnesses in their everyday lives. She was school age when the Nazis took over her native town of Al in Alsace. When the German came, they instituted the famous Hail Hitler. Now, Hail Hitler was the greeting of all the children when they came into school. When the teacher came in, they had to go up and stretch their arm and say, Heil Hitler. When he got out of the class, they got on the feet, Heil Hitler. Now, a, something I would like to stress is that that Heil Hitler is a physical greeting. The hands up in class outside in the street like that. You will see Hitler once in a while like that and then you see him again like that, you see. There were the two, but it was always physical. So it was hard to hide. Okay. So, uh, Simone was age 11 when the teacher stood her up in front of 500 students to try to force her mm -hmm. to salute, and she wouldn't. Michele, you and Giovanni interviewed her for your yes. research. What happened to her? So when she was a girl, she got expelled from her school, and then she was sent to a Nazi penitentiary home. Right, for 21 months doing hard labor. So there were about 600 witness children who were expelled from school in in the Nazi realm, mm -hmm. Nazi-occupied Europe. Now, in the play, you also use this document, the uh, Clarona Declaration. Mm -hmm. As we said, most of the Nazis' enemies were biological enemies, meaning it was in their very being. They could not change being Jewish or Slavic yeah. or Roma. But because the witnesses were ideological enemies, as a part of the psychological pressure, the Nazis offered them a way out. Now, in the play, the Nazi guard offers the witness this document. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Mm -hmm. uh, so the Nazis actually offered the witnesses a chance to get out of these prisons and camps um, if they agreed to give up their religion. Uh, all they had to do was sign this piece of paper and they would be freed. Um, but most witnesses never sign this piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And we know that the authorities even offered this opportunity to prisoners who were condemned to death. There mm -hmm. was a prisoner by the name of Franz Reiter. He was an Austrian. He was in the Berlin Plötzensee prison with four other witnesses and uh, condemned to death by beheading. And we have an excerpt from mm -hmm. his farewell letter that he wrote to his mother. He wrote, I am strongly convinced in my belief that I am acting correctly. Being here, I could still change my mind, but with God, this would be disloyalty. All of us here wish to be faithful to God, to his honor. And Franz and the other four were beheaded. Himmler reportedly said conscientious objectors who wouldn't fight for the Germany mm -hmm. weren't worth a German bullet. So here we have the situation, they were seen as traitors because they would not vote for Hitler, they would not hail him, they would not hate who the Nazis said they should hate, and they would not kill for Germany. Now let's switch to the US context. We have an entirely different situation here. Mm -hmm. in, in Germany you have the supreme leader, uh, non-existent human rights, and dissent could be fatal. In the United States there were constitutional safeguards and a functioning judicial system. Mm -hmm. And yet we have to say that what was happening in, in Nazi Germany did strongly affect the climate here in the US. Mm -hmm. 
So there was great concern about spies, of course, and traitors, <laughs> but also immigrants. Many immigrants after World War I came, and the idea was to use the salute to inculcate loyalty. And uh, this is a map of uh, 1928, an ACLU study that showed the number of states that actually implemented compulsory patriotic ceremonies. There were teacher loyalty oaths and also the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, Michaela, if those who are watching carefully mm -hmm. noticed that you gave a certain type of pledge. Yeah. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah, so in the 1930s, people said the pledge with the Bellamy salute, with their arms stiff. Um, and sometimes they'd put their hand like this with their palm facing down over their heart. And when they would say the words with liberty and justice for all, they would stretch it, their arm out like this. And sometimes their palm would be faced up and sometimes it would be face down. Mm -hmm. So uh, Giovanni, you were Billy in the play. Um, now we understand why witnesses in Germany felt that giving the Heil Hitler was really like worshiping Hitler. But did Billy and the other witness kids also feel that saluting the American flag was some kind of religious act? Yeah, um, even though they obey the laws uh, wherever they live, uh, they, be they believe that they should only pledge their allegiance to God. Uh, and of course, having to say the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, looking like the Hitler salute, uh, must have bothered the witnesses who knew what the witnesses in Germany were going through at the time. Interesting point. Actually, a lot of people were bothered by the salute, and in Congress in December of 1942, they changed the way the salute, what was given. But as you see in this photograph, this is 1965, this young student, witness student, is still not, not saluting, mm -hmm. and that proves to be the case today as well. Mm -hmm. Giovanni, what do you say to the teacher to explain your position? Um, I would say something like, uh, as a Jehovah's Witness, um, I remain apolitical or neutral. Uh, while I do respect the flag, uh, it would be against my conscience to pledge my allegiance to a flag uh, when I've already pledged my allegiance to Jehovah God. Thank you. And Michaela, can you explain why she's standing and not sitting? Yes, so um, we uh, obey all laws unless they contradict with God's law. Um, in the Bible, there were three Hebrew boys who were commanded to go with everyone else to a certain place um, where they would worship a golden image that was made for the king of Babylon. And these three boys obeyed as far as they could by going to that place, and they didn't break God's law, um, but they drew the line when they were told to bow down, and they stood up. And so that's why I stand respectfully when um, the people are saying the Pledge of Allegiance, but I just don't recite it. And the same principle actually applied to witnesses, as you mentioned, during World War II, when there was the draft. Mm -hmm. They registered because that was part of the law, but then they refused to put on the uniform and take up weapons. There were about 4,500 witnesses who were jailed as objectors in the U.S., about three quarters of the total. And um, even now, by the way, 95% of conscientious objectors jailed around the world are Jehovah's Witnesses. So we have now 2,000 children about who were expelled and uh, those who would not join the army. And it's uh, quite understandable in a way that in the atmosphere of the wartime, it was concluded that you don't salute, you don't fight, you don't vote, you must be pro-Nazi. <laughs> So thank you very much for helping us to set this context. Now we're ready to actually get into the story of the Gobitises and the Barnetts. Thank, thank you. you.